everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are just a few minutes out from our webinar, so it's just hang tight. We will be starting momentarily, but until then, you can get a good look at everyone's faces. They're looking lovely and fresh and Napa Valley-esque. I don't know uh, which Brady Bunch block you have up currently, but I've got, you know, the beautifully beautiful, beautiful Natalie on my right and Jenny down in the corner. I've got Andrew right below me, Dan looking schnazzy, and then Jonah with his scarf. Everybody's looking like they're fresh and appropriately dressed for serving a blanc day. So this should be very exciting. Jonah, I love the Abe Schoner scarf. There it is. And it has All to right. go. Shot I, had to say, I had to start. <laughs> hey, hey, not, oh, just 10 o'clock. <laughs> No, no, it's great. It's great that Abe uh, learned this little trick from someone else. And I think that's a wonderful thing for Abe, you know. <laughs> wonderful. Oh, man. If, uh, if you haven't guessed already, this should be an amusing and educational seminar for the next hour or so. <laughs> Natalie, what you got behind you? All the wines? Look at you. Thank you. If anyone forgets what the wines are, Natalie has has beautifully sent them up. Thank you. Like is that Bailey? Myself. Is that Bailey Vanna behind White. you too? I know, right over my corner too. Oh, I can van a white for you like all day. Don't worry. Amazing. What would an what? event be without Jonah and a scarf? It's true. It, it, it wouldn't it be an event at all. It would not be an event at all. I just like how Andrew is about, he's going to do some like tight, he's going to do some like tartaric tests for us there, I think. We're going to get some TA numbers out of him here in a bit. Yeah, I'm trying to make this look as official as possible so nobody knows that it's not, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like your virtual background <laughs> of the laboratory. <laughs> it was this or Breaking Bad. I wasn't sure how appropriate the blue method was going to be, but. I mean. <laughs> give it like one more minute guys I, I do think there should be a zoom seminar on uh what your background says about you so as we look around at at your uh breaking bad slash other labs and jenny jenny out in the wild i think that's appropriate natalie just composed and put together with hers and then jono with something super quirky in the background like a quote about gooseberries Dan, nothing like nothing like gooseberry so in the morning <laughs> The gooseberries <laughs> taste like gooseberries. That's right. That's right. Connor, like are you going Jenny's, to post the wines? Yeah, that's good. I like how Jenny, though, she's got a team of, like, production assistants around right. and everything. I, I look at her. She's talking to people off camera. She's directing while she's doing this. This is great. I'm talking to the birds. <laughs> she's actually simulcast on Bravo right now. You're not seeing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. All right, guys. Well, it's 102, so we're going we're gonna to kick it off. Thank you all so much for joining us. We have attendees joining us from over 10 countries this morning slash afternoon slash evening, wherever you are joining us in the world. Thank you so much for being here on behalf of the Napa Valley Vintners. Um, welcome. I am Amanda McCross, and I'll be hosting and moderating this wonderful seminar. Um, the Napa Valley Vintners, for those of you who are unaware of what they do, it's an amazing organization of 550 wineries uh, in the Napa Valley that are joined together to promote, protect, and enhance the region. So we're really, really excited to be here on behalf of them. Um, this is the first of the Napa Valley session. Uh, though it is not the first Napa Valley Vintners webinar seminar, um, this is the first of a series of virtual classes, and I'm, of course, honored to be your inaugural host, hosting about uh, Sauvignon Blanc this morning, slash afternoon, slash evening. Um, and you can find recordings of past webinars on the Napa Valley Vintners website, napavintners.com, as well as a list of upcoming Napa sessions to be posted there soon. Um, they have some really amazing programs coming up over the next few months. And as you guys are all uh, doing what you're doing in your own respective locations, really an amazing place to go and find resources for all of your wine knowledge. Um, if you love Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc, if you're looking to just try a bottle or two, um, there is a list going up on the site of all of the current release Napa Valley Sauvignon Blancs. So head there to Napa Vintners, that will be posted there. Um, and then direct links to the, the sessions and the Sauvignon Blanc page will be sent in an email uh, following today. So you guys will, uh, will get to have access to all that great stuff. So um, without any further ado, a re-welcome to all of you. <laughs> Um, we're really, really excited to have you. We're going to start today, um, and just a quick housekeeping thing. If you guys have questions, I see you. Um, 
uh, are, some of you are on the chat already, but if you have questions, please feel free to utilize uh, the chat box. And I think there's a, a question and answer box. I will tell you there's a fly buzzing around my head. So if you see me swatting, um, don't be alarmed. I'm fine. It's just there's a fly and I'm trying to keep it away from the wine. Um, so we're going to start with, with a couple of questions. Uh, since I can't see your faces, you can only see mine and I can't see a show of hands, we're going to use a poll. So a series of questions geared towards the, uh, the trade audience and then the consumer audience as well. So Connor, could you put up the poll questions for me? There we go. So for members of the wine trade, how many of you have a Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc on your wine list or retail shelf? Um, I know at press, I had quite a few. Uh, for everyone, how many of you have tasted a Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc before? I, I'm sure there's a few hands going up in this room. And then uh, for everyone, how many of you feel like you have a good understanding of what Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc tastes like? I think that's a very interesting question. Um, oh, it says that I can't vote. All right. How, how rude. I like that you're miming, Jonah. Are you taking- I felt the same thing. I was trying to vote very quickly on all of them. I was too. All right. Well, hopefully I can see these results. Connor, can I see these results right away? How's this, how does this poll work? Yeah, people are actually still voting. So let's just oh, leave it great. open just a second or two more. It's still great. counting up. Um, cool. And then you will I'll launch it in just a second. All right. All right. I love it. All right. What does that say? 28% of you um, have a Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc on your, on your wine list or retail shelf. So, well, we've got a lot of people who, which is not applicable. So I think that's fair, but 5% of you said, no, what are you doing with your lives? What are you putting in place of that? Um, for everyone, how many of you tasted a Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc before? 96% uh, of you said yes, 4% of you have said no. I think that's very interesting. Um, and then for everyone, how many of you feel like you have a good understanding of what Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc tastes like? A very interesting split of 63% who have said yes and 37% who have said no. And I think today's seminar is gonna be a very interesting tell uh, for that last question of, of what we think Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc tastes like. Uh, it's an, an incredibly important grape in Napa Valley, one that you're almost always going to find uh, on any wine list across, across the United States. And of course, uh, something that's usually featured by the glass. So something that a consumer often asks for just, you know, as kind of a, even a throwaway, you know, the way that people ask for a white wine oftentimes is just, do you have a Sauvignon Blanc? And I'm sure many of you who are in the trade can, can speak to that. Um, as probably many of you know, there are many, many, many styles of Sauvignon Blanc across the globe. Uh, when we think of certain regions like New Zealand, like Sancerre, or producers like Dagano or Smith Oat Lafitte, you know, we think of, uh, we think of the wine being a chameleon. So we think of it being in a lot of different styles. Um, but what many of you might not know is that all of those styles that we love that are seen across the globe can actually exist in this very small region of Napa Valley, which I think is going to be a really fun thing to examine today. Because I think when we think of those amazing styles across the world, those amazing producers, um, so many of you who are sitting with us today really sort of find inspiration from those producers and from those regions. Uh, so today I've compiled five panelists who uh, represent different wineries across the Napa Valley. So we're going to start by introducing Natalie. Natalie Bath, will you please introduce yourself? Figure out the unmute. Hi, everyone. Yes. I'm Natalie Bath. I'm the lead winemaker for the Crossroads by Rudd uh, Sauvignon Blanc. And what was the best bottle of Napa Valley wine that you drank while you were sheltering in place? Um, I don't have a lot of opportunity to drink a lot of really old Napa Valley wines. And so I actually had access to a 1979 Spring Mountain Vineyard that was Ooh. absolutely spectacular and just really nice to see it holding up so well and being so bright. Sweet. Jonah, was it um, uh, John, uh, the winemaker then? Yeah, that yeah. 79 Spring Mountain Cab was made by uh, John Williams when he was... Uh, using half of Spring Mountain at that time to start pilfering <laughs> yeah. stuff for frog seed. So <laughs> we have a lot of connective tissue with that wine, that's for sure. <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, Andrew Wright from Maryville, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what your favorite bottle of Napa Valley wine was while you sheltered in place. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Andrew Wright, the winemaker for Maryville. And uh, I think that my favorite wine I had going through my back stash, I had an old bottle of 
I think 2001 uh, Bond. Fancy. From, uh, I like it. From, well, my wife cleaned out our shed as a quarantine project, which just meant I found the old wine. So <laughs> I was into that. Okay. <laughs> Do you, you remember keep which, your uh, Bond in a shed? I think that's wonderful. It's a very <laughs> fancy, it's back in, it's a back in shed. It's not a back in shed. <laughs> not a back in shed. What was the, what was the, um, the vineyard? Uh, I want to say Vine Hill. Vi oh, so Vicina? Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Uh, Jonah Beer needs no introduction, but we're going to give him one anyway. Jonah Beer, Frogs Leave. Well, who are you and what was the best thing you drank during Shelter in Place? Uh, who am I? Great question. Why am I on this panel? Better question. <laughs> uh, the talent around this little ring is extraordinary, so I'm just happy to be pretending to belong. Uh, I've been Vice President of Frogs Leave for 17 years. And best thing I had, I think probably like what Natalie may have experienced, I had a friend who was uh, uh, feeling like the end of the world was nigh. And so he decided he wanted to open up a 1961 Inglenook cab. And that's, uh, that was one of those uh, moments where I felt like, well, if this is the end, it was, it was the right time to drink this. It was outstanding. And you think about guys like John Daniel and what they meant in Napa Valley. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Inglenook is a, a formative uh, winery for many reasons, but uh, especially formative to the seminar. Um, Jenny Wagner. We're so excited to have you in your envelope room, right? Can you tell us who you are and the best thing that you drank during Shelter in Place? Yes, um, I'm Jenny Wagner and I make the Emelo wines. Um, I think the my most favorite wine that I discovered at least uh, over Shelter in Place would have been the Hay Fork uh, 2019 Grenache Blanc. So yes. unlike the three before me uh, older wines, I kind of, with the spring weather and being stuck inside, I was excited to have a spring kind of summery, fresh white wine. Um, it's made by Haley White. Uh, her family's yeah. been part of the Llewellyn Ranch. Um, they've been here in Napa Valley farming since the 1860s. Um, so she's got some cool farming history here. Um, but her Grenache block actually comes from Calistoga from Kennefic Ranch. It's delicious. We used to serve it by the glass at press uh, cool. whenever we could and it would run out so quickly. It was like I blinked and it was gone. Um, yeah. Delicious, delicious wine. Uh, and of course, last but not least, we have Dan Petrowski of Lurk Mead, who uh, again, probably needs no introduction, but uh, I'll, here you are. Let's tell me what you were drinking a bit during, and I won't, maybe won't limit it to Napa Valley wine, but if you want to give me Napa Valley wine and a, a favorite quarantini by all means. Yeah, I, I spent my, the majority of shelter in place uh, quarantining with cocktails every night. Um, but I did get out to Press Restaurant when the reopen happened, Press our, our Napa Valley Steakhouse in St. Helena. And I actually, Jonah, I had um, mid to late 90s uh, Frog Fleet Merlot, which was stunning and probably my um, American domestic wine of quarantine. So, uh, and I think that that was, uh, that was, it felt really good to be out and felt really good to be, you know, in a restaurant and drinking a great California wine, a great Napa Valley wine. So that was my uh, the wine of the, the of the shelter in place. Yeah, that's awesome. And what are we tasting with you today? Uh, we are tasting the Larkney Vineyard Sauvignon Blanc uh, Lily, uh, 2018. Really? Beautiful. I just wanted to make you say that. Um, yeah, that those <laughs> those early frogs eat merlots are. are Stunning. Those are some of my favorite and formative wines to my own uh, wine ed edification. Um, so Sauvignon Blanc in Napa Valley, let's talk about it. It has a, a deep history. It is the number two most important white variety in Napa Valley, only superseded by Chardonnay, which I think is very interesting. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the earliest plantings in Napa Valley were courtesy of Gustav Niebaum of Inglenook, who we talked about uh, just moments ago. So uh, they arrived here prior to that courtesy of a little, a little winery called Chateau Ikem in Bordeaux. Um, so those cuttings came from that vineyard and that was the, the first entry point of Sauvignon Blanc into California. From there, uh, Georges Latour of BV, he chose Sauvignon Blanc as, as one of his imported whites. Uh, he won gold awards for theirs at the 1915 International Expo in San Francisco. Um, interestingly, it used to just be called Sautern. So back in the day, prior to uh, us labeling in, uh, in Napa Valley by variety, it was actually labeled by region, which of course now we all think of that as absolutely insane. Um, but once upon a time, we had things like Napa Valley Sautern. And Dan, I, I've seen some old Larkmead Sautern and I've seen some old Napa Valley uh, Charles Krug Burgundy. So you can find some of these old bottles that are labeled not by the variety, but by the variety we associate. Uh, it's sort of homeland 
um, homeland terroir to. So back in the day, it was called Napa Valley Saltern. That changed um, as a result of a few things, one being the most famous, which was Robert Mondavi, who saw uh, the production of Sauvignon Blanc as being a little bit sweet. It was often made into some jug wine. People thought of Sauternes and they thought of that. Uh, and he really thought Sauvignon Blanc had a chance in Napa Valley, and, and I am certainly glad that he did. Um, and so in the 1960s, he decided to, to borrow from our friends in the Loire Valley who were producing Foy Fume, and he changed the name to Fume Blanc. So now we've got Fume Blanc in Napa Valley, which uh, is a synonym for serving a Blanc. You can legally put it on the bottle. It doesn't, it doesn't denote any sort of stylistic uh, change or stylistic preference. Um, it just denotes that it's Sauvignon Blanc. And, and so people saw that in, in the 1960s and 70s. It really became popular. And that's really what spawned the growth of Sauvignon Blanc in Napa Valley, which I always think is a great, great story. Um, so he rehabbed Sauvignon Blanc's reputation. Uh, and the new name made all the difference. It put Sauvignon Blanc back on the map and into the hearts of American wine drinkers around the country. Um, so without any further ado, I think we should drink wine. Is everyone thirsty? Yes. Amazing. So we are going to start with Natalie Bath, who's going to talk about uh, what she is doing with this Crossroads Sauvignon Blanc from Mount Viter. Natalie, take it away. What's going on in this wine? All right. So uh, what you all have in your glass is the 2018 uh, Sauvignon Blanc. I think we're one of the few producers who took, uh, well, actually most people on this panel took prime Cabernet Sauvignon real estate and decided to plant Sauvignon Blanc there. And unique for Mount Viter as well. We're about 1,600 feet up in elevation, um, east, southeast facing right along the crest of the Mayacamas. The big thing for us is that we're right above that fog line in the morning. So we have really great um, altitude exposure in different microclimates up there, which just poses a really interesting way of playing around with sodium blanc, just because of the earlier ripening up there that we can get, as well as actually um, kind of enhancing the higher acidity level and lower sugars. Um, we have about seven acres that were planted up there in the early 2000s. Um, this wine, you know, Rudd's been making Sauvignon Blanc for a long time, and this is something for me that I get to experiment a little bit more on the winemaking side. Um, we typically harvest this. <laughs> yes, thanks guys. Uh, <laughs> we typically harvest this uh, between the end of August and into mid-September. Um, because we have the forest ridge line up there right to our back, um, we do have a block up there that comes in a little bit towards the end of it. So we do kind of get a nice spectrum of about five picks that end up going into this particular wine. Um, fairly standard, I would say, from a harvesting in the early morning, coming down. We actually hand sort uh, into our pneumatic press to pick out any water berries or shop berries or anything like that. Um, kind of a champagne press cycle where we're looking for you know, not too hard, but pretty long, um, going into a, a stainless steel tank to settle overnight. Um, and then what we're going to do the next day is rack off the gross leaves um, and into its fermentation vessels in our cave. This can range from anything from the, you know, the symbolic concrete egg that you see now a lot more to larger format punch-ins, some cigar barrels, some standard 60 gallon. But we also introduced in 2015 the Amphoras into the lineup to kind of enhance a little bit more texture and mouthfeel into it. Um, from there, it's a pretty cool long fermentation, just being that the highest temperature we really get to um, at the peak is about 70 degrees. So our fermentations, while they might start at mid-September, can hang out really awesomely through Thanksgiving <laughs> and into December to keep us working a bit. Um, but I think that gives us just a little bit more energy, a little more texture and nuances to the wine. From there, we don't really rack too much unless we're seeing any sort of reductive nature in the wine, but it's about eight months aging on the lees. Um, blending comes down to about the seven month mark and then we'll filter it and bottle it in July. So pretty, yeah. pretty fun. It's a pretty wine. We, um, you know, of course, uh, this was a, a staple at press, but um, a wine that I think, you know, as we're looking at this lineup, we are looking at tasting the lightest, crispest, uh, crispiest, I don't, is that, the, is that a word? Um, no, yes. not a word. Like um, <laughs> most crispy, uh, lightest, most crispy of the Sauvignon Blancs. <laughs> Forgive me guys, I am a little jealous. Um, and uh, as we go through, they're going to start to put on more weight. You know, it's interesting, I, you guys actually make a few different Sauvignon Blancs at Rudd. Um, what was the, the impetus for making this the, the cleanest and sort of brightest uh, of that lineup and of our lineup? 
Well, Dan's cheating, as you can see. I didn't even get a bottle of our red Sauvignon Blanc for the tasting, so that goes to show you. But <laughs> I took advantage of the opportunity to taste more than one Sauvignon Blanc this morning. So I like it. Why not? But you know, I think the and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, you're tasting it, and I'm not. But I think the red Sauvignon Blanc is very austere, very linear, and we do blend in some Semillon, which does add a little bit of fat and a little richness in the mid palate even a little Sauvignon Gris, which can gain a little bit more of that phenolic length on the finish. And so this just is a little bit more approachable, I think. The red Sauvignon Blanc, while beautiful, can stand a little bit of aging. And so for me, this is just something that, you know, really should be more playful, more fun. And like I mentioned, just a little bit more experimentation with Sauvignon Blanc as a whole for the varietal. Uh, Natalie, we have a question from uh, Patrick, who's who's asking about the amphoras, which I think is a yes. fun question. What size are the vessels and what percentage of the wine goes into those vessels? Well, they tell you it's 159 gallons. That being said, <laughs> when you look at ours, uh, they all look very different in size, but that's what you get when you get a beautifully handcrafted terracotta amphora from the Medetti family, which is just right outside of the Panzano region. Um, they're about, like I said, 159 gallons, give or take. We can ferment in those, which we bring it down just a little bit to about 120, 130, and then kind of top them up to that total. So in this blend, uh, I think it's about 14% is actually the amphora in this wine. Super pretty. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this wine later, but I want to move to the Maryvale. Andrew, you're doing some yeah. fun stuff over there. Um, yeah, you know, I thought it... <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the Maryvale and what's going on in, in this glass. Yeah, thanks. So and thank you everyone for demonstrating the bottles. I appreciate it. <laughs> Here. Here's the Maryvale. So Maryvale, um, and I feel a little bit sheepish talking about the Juliana Vineyard before Dan. Um, that doesn't seem right to me somehow. Um, but we source our fruit from Juliana, which is a famous vineyard in Pope Valley. So just over on the other side of Howell Mountain. Um, ours is uh, from block uh, 16A, I believe, and had been sourcing from different blocks down there as well. Um, Juliana is an interesting site. It's old vines. It uh, looks like a jungle a lot of the time, uh, but somehow that works for the SB, I find. Uh, a lot of um, dappled sunlight getting through to the clusters there. Juliana is also a really like hot site. In late summer, it can really, really get pretty hot up there. So unlike Natalie, we don't have the luxury of kind of spreading out those picks over, over a few weeks. Uh, I tend to bring it all in in one or two days um, because I've seen sometimes the bricks and the sugar levels, and I'm sure Dan can attest to this too, those will go crazy high from one day to the next. So it's a lot of sampling and it's a lot of trying to time the pick. But if you can time the pick in Juliana, I find it's really interesting because you can retain really high natural acidity, but also really expressive uh, fruit. And I find Juliana to be one of the most I think um, expressive vineyards have a distinct, I think, distinct vineyards for Sauvignon Blanc um, in the valley for sure. Um, what so, makes it distinct, Andrew? Uh, I, I just think the, 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 the aromatics to me have this kind of lemon rind, um, lychee kind of thing, especially when the wines are young. And this is a 2019, uh, by the way, I think it's the only 19 in the lineup. So it's still really young. It was bottled in March. Um, and for me, it's almost like an aperitivo style of Sauvignon Blanc. It's like a Negroni Sauvignon Blanc, if that makes sense. Um, so, so like I've had, I've had people say it almost, when it's really young, it's a little bit bitter, um, which I, I don't know that I'd agree with that. Although I do think that there are those lemon rind characteristics, which I really like. But as that ages out, and even as it opens, this is actually a Sauvignon Blanc that could stand for some decanting, that kind of really integrates and it becomes this beautiful floral expression. Um, yeah, so I, I think any time I was tasting through and I smelled Dan's, I was like, oh, that's definitely Juliana. Like, you can you just feel Juliana and the Massacan stuff from him as well. I uh, feel the same way, not to give Dan too much love ahead of time. But um, for Sauvignon Blanc, for me, in the Valley, I've kind of gone through many different iterations of how I like to make it. And for my, my personal taste, way back in the day, I was like, man, my favorite Sauvignon Blanc is Domaine de Chevalier. And so then it was like, how do we kind of not really copy that because obviously we're not France, but how do I appropriate some of those techniques? And so what we used to do is kind of champagne cycle, whole cluster press um, directly to barrels. So 600 liter, 500 liter, and then the uh, 325 liter cigars, letting it settle in barrel overnight and then racking barrel to barrel the following day for barrel fermentation. 
Um, made some really lovely wines, but that's a really, really labor intensive process. And everybody's got to be on the same page. And, and you know, if you got a lot going on in the cellar, it can be difficult, and especially in Mary Bell, which is a very, very old cellar. It's really challenging. So what I've kind of settled on is half of it gets, comes in, gets destemmed, and sits in tea bins overnight in the cold room. And the other half of it gets pressed off right away to a settling tank. Um, then we're checking NTUs the next day, racking the barrel. Um, and what I've found is that the, the de-stemming into the tea bins and the cold soak gives it a really like nice unctuousness in the mid palate, which I really, really enjoy. Um, and it's certainly not Domaine de Chevalier, of course, but I mean, I've kind of changed my style, but at the same time, I feel like it's more, uh, I don't know, reflective of Napa, of like how people drink Sauvignon Blanc in Napa too. You know what I mean? Where it's like can it's you, fresh. Can you expand? Yeah. Can you expand on that? Yeah. I mean, in Maryville, we have a great patio that's right on Highway 29. It's the summertime. People are out there all the time. Even now with, with COVID, I mean, it's all safe and socially distanced or whatever. But, um, you know, when, when you make those wines in kind of the more classic Domaine de Chevalier, I mean, not to go back to that well, but in that style, right? Those are wines you can really lay down. And I think that they exhibit themselves and express themselves most fully after like sometimes two, three, four years in the bottle, which is kind of counterintuitive to how people think about Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but for me, it kind of becomes this beautiful floral explosion. Um, here, people tend to drink those wines a lot faster. It tends to be a summertime afternoon wine, right? And so it's kind of like, I'm making a wine over here for people who are drinking it over here. Like, how do I kind of bridge that gap and make a wine that's, I hate to say this term, but a wine that's fun to drink, but it's still expressive of the vineyard and still kind of expressive of the style that I'm, that I'm interested in. So yeah. that's, I think, what I mean by that. Yeah, um, two, two very different wines. I mean, you go from the crossroads yeah. to this, and already we're seeing a huge stylistic difference, aromatic difference. I mean, things are, are changing very, very quickly. But yeah, oh, it, gooseberry. Yes, Jonah, the gooseberry is ever present in this wine, for sure. It's, go it's gooseberry, it's lychee fruit, it's, it's some of that lemon rind to me. It's almost reminds me of like an Asian bubble tea, too, at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, what a fun yeah, descriptor. I, yeah, I just think that, uh, so now I've kind of at a place where I'm like, I want... I want that kind of unctuous phenolic mid palate, not not overly so, but uh, it kind of rides on a natural acidity, and and is really a, a fun summertime wine. And you know, I've had older older Maryvales uh, that that can definitely definitely age. It's just that with our you know this wine basically is gone within six months, and so it's kind of like you know, trying to yeah encapsulate all of what Juliana is and all of what that style is in a wine that's 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 fresh and young. Yeah. And for those, uh, I mean, I think we're gonna have a really interesting discussion once we get through all of these wines, uh, comparing and contrasting maybe the Larkmead and the Maryvale to see uh, those, that vineyard sort of done in two different styles. Um, I do wanna kick it off to, uh, to Jonah at Frog's Leap. Um, we've got a very special Frog's Leap. So, you know, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with the Frog's Leap Sauvignon Blanc, um, a very, a very classic Sauvignon Blanc in the sense that it's, you know, I, I poured it by the glass. I'm very familiar with that wine. This is something very different. This is the Rachel Rossi Reserve. Um, so Jonah, I want to kick it off to you. I think it's really interesting. You know, you guys are a, a heritage winery, a winery that's been around since the 80s. Um, when people think of Napa Valley and they think of Frogsley, they think, think of a certain thing. Um, but then you've got something like the Rachel Rossi, which sort of promotes this, this, uh, <laughs> um, something new, something, uh, something a little bit more progressive and, and uh, interesting. So let's talk about Rachel Rossi and what you guys are doing with it. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Dan was gestating properly wildly there to get your attention. So I want to toss it to him for a second. Did you have something to, to tap oh, in? Oh, I'm sorry, there? Dan. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I know that everyone's screens are different where we're located. No, I just, just as a, a point of reference, the lark meat is actually a state fruit. Um, Juliana oh, is is a vineyard I've been working with for years alongside the folks at Maryvale, who used to own Juliana um, right. up until 2014. So uh, just a correction there, but we'll get into that later. Okay, thank you. I, I definitely yeah. didn't smell Juliana and Dan's wine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, well, listen, thank you, Amanda. And obviously, I think already we're off to an amazing start. And I want to do a quick plus one uh, on uh, Andrew's comments about hanging out on the, the uh, patio there at Maryvale in the summertime. It is one of the most uh, special places and not for the least of rich because it's run by a good friend named Devin Joshua. So you got to go there and check it out and just say hi to Devin and drink some wine with him. He's, he's great. Um, 
And I also, Andrew, I think it's great that you're talking about inspiration ones. Like, I, I, I feel the same way. Like, we don't want to copy someone else's uh, style or approach. But we all have to gain inspiration for some, from something. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's when you try to become, when you try to mimic them and you become a poor facsimile of their version that that's when things to me kind of turn out to be a little bit less than desirable. And this is certainly one for us. You know, this is like, so you talk about the worst financial decision a winery can make. Okay. <laughs> we've got, uh, we've got literally about, uh, well, sorry, Dan. A, a, a non-Instagrammable label. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. Three things that we've made uh, <laughs> inscrutable. But the first thing is this is, uh, this is from a vineyard that goes back to the, to 1907, uh, right on the Rutherford bench. And if you've been driving down highway 29, just not north of, if you're on your way from Napa to Press Restaurant and you're driving up Highway 29 on the left, just after Whitehall Lane Winery, there's a long driveway, one of those old wooden water towers in Victorian, and that is the Rossi Vineyard for Frog's Leap. And it's, it's, it really goes back to the 1800s, but it was owned by the Rossi family starting in 1907. And Rachel Rossi became kind of like the pioneering woman of the Napa Valley from the standpoint that her her husband passed away and with three kids, she not only took over the estate and farming, but she got him through prohibition. She was a proper bootlegger. Like she really was kind of one of these powerful women um, in, the, in, the, in, in a man's field uh, back then, let alone today. And to see what she did and how she did it was quite amazing. And we have these Sauvignon Blanc vines that sit on arguably our single best of that 52 acres, there's at least 20 that are just kind of A plus Cabernet Sauvignon, Rutherford Bench, Alluvial Fan, you know, ticks all the boxes of what you want for cab. And we have these old Sauvignon Blanc vines, head trained, dry farmed, never had a drop of irrigation, never had a fertilizer or a pesticide. And, you know, I would fire up the old D4 every year, like, let's rip these suckers out. Let's get to some cab. And, <laughs> Thankfully, uh, cooler heads prevailed, and especially John Williams, the owner, winemaker, founder of Frog's Leap, his son, Rory, who's taken over vineyard management, assistant winemaker. These vines never really, they, they, they always had a hard time finding their path forward, and he decided he would take on personally, he'd prune everyone, he'd care for everyone, he would kind of uh, curate these little, this little section. Uh, they were planted in 1981, same year as the winery was founded. And uh, we've been making it uh, for the last, and now this will be our third vintage. And it's really been great to see. It's allowed us to take on, and I think Amanda, to your point, we've been at this for 40 years, and to take on a, a sense of innovation and experimentation in a winery that Sauvignon Blanc is almost what we're synonymous with, you know? And the well, you guys started with it, right? 1981, yeah, from Spotswood. We got those yeah. grapes from Spotswood when, so, and, and, and Amanda, 1981 was kind of the second wave of this, right? You had this Mandavi Fume sitch going on, but by 1981, there was, it, it was a lot of Semillon and barrel and, you know, trying to make Sauvignon Blanc not taste like Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. And along came Frog Sleep to make it all stainless steel, no oak, no malolactic, no Semillon, because we couldn't afford barrels in essence. Uh, and establish like a new style, you know, an 11 and a half percent alcohol, racy, almost no fruit. We, we always say in Sauvignon Blanc, the, over, the only thing that's overrated is fruit flavor. We want sea spray and salt water <laughs> and oyster shell. And, uh, and, and then, but you do that for 37 years and you kind of get into a groove. And what's amazing is to see how Rory and John still can commit to the idea of, hey, we're going to go ahead and make this. We're going to go ahead and do this in a different way. So this is uh, 125 cases, one concrete egg. It's, uh, you know, everything kind of like everyone else's style. It just gets a, a short whole cluster press cycle. It goes into the egg, but it stays there for a year on its primary fermentation leads. And I think that's where Natalie talks about reduction and like you're going to rack if you see some, we, we want to keep a little in, you know. So this is our version of seeing like what happens. And if we push frog sleep something blunt by one or two extra months of lees aging, you don't really see a lot in the Grand Cuvée. But if you take something and you push it for a year, and then you bottle age it for a year, you can really start to see uh, the impact. And so that's been a big thing for us is like, how do we, uh, how do we use this as an innovation tool? And so 
One concrete egg. We bought the stupid egg because everyone told us it would make the leaves circulate. Turns out that's electrostatic and we didn't need the damn egg to begin with. So, you know, there's 25,000 I'll never get back. Like any concrete vessel probably would have worked <laughs> just fine. Uh, but there we go. I don't have Jenny Wagner money, so I, I got I to gotta save my pennies where I can. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, well, before yeah. we get to Jenny, um, we have two questions. Uh, one from Greg. Is the Rachel Rossi available outside of the tasting room? It is not. It's uh, with with 125 cases and a ridiculous price of $75 per bottle, uh, which is it makes it the most expensive wine in the Frog Sleep lineup. More expensive than our Cabernet is is our Rachel Rossi Sauvignon Blanc, which was also a challenge I put out to John and and Rory was well if we're going to do this we got to make a little bit of money. Yeah. And so it is at the tasting room and uh, and occasionally it's a few sneak out to like a great restaurant like a press for instance. You might see it somewhere that. in the wild. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, it's interesting. It, I mean, tasting the frog leap as we think about how how these wines are changing uh, from from wine to wine. Um, you know, we had the crossroads really lean, kind of bright, lots of minerality, um, more of these uh, classic lemon lime flavors, um, and then we went to the Maryville, kind of brought on texture, brought on a little bit more nuance, that gooseberry, and then you have the frog's leap, which is kind of somewhere in the middle. Like you have all this broadness, all this texture, but you don't have uh, the oak impartation, you don't have the the gooseberry aromatics. Um, the aromatics are closer to that of something from Crossroads. So uh, if right. anyone wants to comment on, on what we've tasted thus far, I think now is an appropriate time to do that. But just be kind, Andrew, Dan, Natalie, be sweet at least. So. I love the wine. I think it's great. Yeah. I think they've all been really nice so far for sure. I love the texture. I, working at the reserve with the eggs for so many years, I really, really appreciate that, that texture without I feel like losing any of that linear tension in the wine. I feel like it's a nice balance of both of those things. So yeah, well done, for sure. Well, and that's I, actually the, a, a perfect segue because somebody had asked, uh, how does a concrete egg affect the flavor of the Sauvignon Blanc? So Andrew, I mean, Andrew, you worked at Napa Valley Reserve, which is just like a winemaker's experimental playground on steroids. It's just like an insane place. And if you've ever, if you ever get the chance to walk through that place, if you ever want to see like what's coming down the line 10 years that every winery will have, go to Napa Valley Reserve because they probably have it already. And it was um, all my idea. Oh, all. you're so brilliant. I love that. <laughs> um, Andrew and Jonah, can you speak to the concrete egg and how it aff affects the flavor of, of serving a Blanc? Um, I'll take a, I'll take the first shot. Um, so just the shape of the egg allows for like a natural lees stirring inside of inside of the vessel. As you have, you know, like the fermentations happening, carbon dioxide's going up. You have dead yeast cells kind of going down, and it creates it creates a current inside the egg. So you're you're constantly having this gentle lees stirring. So maybe not as overt as a batonnage would be, say in a barrel fermentation, but definitely imprints on the texture. And I always find. Maybe this sounds a little bit reductive or simplistic, but uh, things made in concrete taste more like minerals. <laughs> I don't know. So, um, uh, yeah, that's that's my that's my two cents. I, I love I love working with the eggs. I think it's it's a really cool textural tool. And uh, Jonah, no, Char Charmaine is asking about your electrostatic comments. If you could just mention. Oh uh, yeah, so you know. we we have the same we had the same idea, right? I, we bought the egg for the same reason. This kind of it, anaerobic or non-oxygen rich kind of batonage that happens as leaves get suspended and moved around. So we bought the egg and it was great. And then we wanted to try some for storage. And so we had Sonoma Castone make us what looks like a Rubik's cube that holds uh, four barrels worth of wine. And we saw the exact same thing without the shape. And then it was the winemaker up at uh, Lingua Franca who clued me in on some studies they had done where the, the, the real micro-ox element that happens between concrete and wine isn't a porosity. It's not a transference of oxygen through a membrane or through oak or through cellulose fibers, but the contact point between a high acid wine and the base elements of concrete creates um, a reaction. That reaction releases and creates oxygen for the wine. So it gives it a, a slightly like a, it gives it the effect of barrel without the flavor is what we often say. But that also creates the electrostatic charge, which keeps Lee's in suspension. So, Andrew, we were all in on the same thing. But thank God we bought one of these square ones, these cubes, and we found the same thing. So now we have 70 of those. We, we walked away from the uh, egg shape because of the expense and the impracticability and gone to a concrete uh, square, a cube. And we've gotten the same kind of similar suspension of Lee's and kind of uh, wrote, uh, internal batonage without any... Um, 
oxygen. So it's been quite interesting. That's really cool. And uh, Natalie, I'm sorry, uh, Greg uh, reminded me that, of course, Rod has been experimenting with concrete quite a bit. So if you uh, want to chime in here, please feel free. I mean, I think the guy said it, you know, pretty well. I will say the interesting is we added two new eggs. Uh, Rudd's been working with them since 2004, and we added two new ones. And it's, I, I didn't, you know, it's part of the spiel that it is kind of like an iron skillet. The more you use it, the better seasoned it is and the better it is. I 100% agree with that. And that's one thing I would say is that going off one year of use, I do think there's a little bit more of a flavor profile that's probably imparted on the wine. Whereas then like later on, it is more mouthfeel, it is more texture as the eggs get a little bit um, more used. But I do, I do, I'm very interested now in these like Rubik's cubes. Um, I'll just, right, just to put a, right, yeah, you can come over and check them out. Just to yeah. put a bow around it and the concrete discussion, because it's a big one with Sylvain Blanc is that the, the next rabbit hole to go down, uh, Jean-Michel Combe introduced me to it back at Ponte Canet where he actually went out and selected stones from his own vineyard to grind up as the uh, gravel portion, the aggregate, to mix into it. And I was doing blind tastings with him between where he sourced the stone for, and you could taste the difference. And I was like, oh crap, this is just one more <laughs> rabbit hole we get to go down. <laughs> and, and, Ra and Randall Graham used to put limestone in his Cabernet fermenters. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I know Natalie, you guys, you guys kind of did that at Red too. So uh, I mean, the, the concrete situation is something we can maybe dive into more after. Um, but I do want to get to to Jenny uh, because she has produced a pretty incredible and different and unique. I don't know, uh, you know, your your dad uh, clued me in. And he was like, "It's a dead ringer for Dagano," and I think to some degree he's right. Like I think that there is something really unique here. Um, what you're doing in the vineyard is really special. So uh, Jenny Wagner, talk about Hi. the brush. Show me your hairbrush, Jenny. Here's my hairbrush. <laughs> <laughs> I use my hair. Um, so yeah, D Diagonal is, has been an inspirational wine for me, like, like many others, I'm sure. Um, but what I, I love about that wine is its minerality and um, just kind of a, a sulfide kind of stink in a positive way it has to it and i i've been working the last kind of eight years to try and figure out a way to achieve that with being in rutherford um so the grapes for this wine are are grown in the middle of rutherford on the valley floor um between galeron road and, and me lane um almost across the street from uh, the rossi ranch that jonah was talking about for frog's leap um so we're warm it's always the our earliest sauvignon blanc to be harvested um we're about a half mile from the river, so it's kind of a, a pleasant tin loam. There's some clay, there's some some fine silty gravel as well. Um, so while those those factors of climate and soil, of course, are are important and where it all begins, um, I think what makes this this wine, the Plumeray, different um, and special is a farming technique uh, where I utilize this plastic hairbrush you've probably seen in your local gas station, um, kind of cut off the end and. And so at pre-bloom, um, which typically is around, this year it was Cinco de Mayo is when we began. First week of May, we'll, we'll brush the clusters using this. I wish I had a pre-bloom cluster to demonstrate. I'm gonna, but Jenny, as you're talking, yeah, I'm gonna try to share my screen to show you guys the picture. Okay. Hopefully this, hopefully this works. So I'll keep talking while you try to show that. Um, so right before, the week before bloom, we'll, we'll brush these clusters, like 10 to 20 seconds per cluster. And the whole idea behind this is to, to crop thin and you know take 50% or more of the berries off of the cluster. And throughout the growing season from the very beginning, these clusters size up, they see equal sunlight. Um, I only do this to a couple acres because it's very labor intensive and time consuming as you could imagine. Um, but at, at harvest time, the berries on, on these brushed clusters are loosely hanging or gangly. Each berry sees the same sunlight, whereas our control, the, the clusters, you know, the half of the vineyard that we do not brush um, is very dense, compact clusters. And the berries, you know, interior berries don't see that sunlight and um, they're not all equal. So my ultimate reason for doing this is to pick early. So we hand pick. Um, uh, this is the 2015 and I picked it between 20 and 21 bricks. 
Um, so with that, I was able to, of course, retain really bright acidity. This, this wine has got pretty high acid on it, really low pH, low alcohol, um, but leaving out any of the green uh, pyrazine characteristic that is often associated with underripe Sauvignon Blanc. So this picture shows um, the brushing on the, the bottom right corner. You can see the actual act of brushing. Um, and then the, uh, the top picture shows at harvest time brushed versus unbrushed. That's kind of a, a good example of, of what it looks like. You can even see the, the, um, the berries on the brush cluster are, are more yellow. The unbrushed is green. Um, so that is the, uh, a little bit on, on brushing. And it, the idea yeah. of brushing came from a, a vineyard practice. My, my dad used to farm grapes, table grapes in Mexico years ago, and there was a variety called perlette, and that was a common um, practice that he used for, for perlette uh, table grapes to get big, big plump berries. <laughs> yeah, and one thing I do want to point out, um, Jenny, and hopefully I didn't miss this while I was trying to share my screen, yeah. this is a 2015. Yes. So, um, so, and this is current, this is current release, right? Yes, I have 16 bottles, but I have not yet released it. Um, so, uh, this does have long aging on it. I age it for about two years. Um, only 7% of that is stainless steel. Um, and the remaining 93 is, is all oak. 50% 50, 50 of it's neutral. The other 50 is, is new oak, but I use cigars for all the new oak. Um, I, I stir the leaves monthly, kind of gives it some body. I think because it is so tart, this is over over eight, over eight grams per liter um, acid, that I think that it kind of needs that roundness that the aging gives it along with, with the barrels. Um, but the barrels I use are, are not, not meant to give it oakiness per se, but roundness and um, low toast level. So I, I do like, I like that, that a touch to this to the brushed juice. <laughs> yeah, Jenny, when you are um, making this wine, obviously you're, you're tasting it quite a few times. I just, from, for all of our edifications, um, what, it, what does the wine taste like fresh? Um, what does the wine taste like before it's had a little bit of bottle age? And is it remarkably different from, from the 2015 that we're tasting now? Yeah, I think um, yes and no. I, I actually was, just yesterday I was talking to my dad about this wine and when I, when I open it, you know, now it sounds five years old. It sounds like an old Sauvignon Blanc, but I, with this one in particular, I do, I, I think it's gotten better. Um, whereas if I were to taste the 2019 brushed, it's, it's pretty just more astringent. doesn't have that kind of depth and creaminess that I think balances with the, the brightness of it. Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting. I mean, we're seeing the last three wines have had texture and weight, but all for different reasons, uh, which yeah. is really interesting. So you had uh, the Maryville kind of coming from the oak, you have, uh, you have the, um, the frog's leaf coming from a year on leaves, and then now we have the Emelo uh, coming from age, and then also from, from the focus and concentration from the brushing. So, I mean, three very different wines, obviously the Rudd sort of being the outlier of that because it is, it is, um, what we think of when we think of like classically styled Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc to some degree. I mean, if there is such a thing, it's, you know, it's all of that brightness uh, and austerity. And, and now we've got three kind of weighty wines that we don't necessarily think of when we think of Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc. And I don't think, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that we think of Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc being an ageable wine. What are your thoughts? And was that an I, issue when I, you went? <laughs> I would just, I mean, honestly, I think that that's something that's really important, Amanda, that we've overlooked is that there is, uh, there is an ageability to Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc. There's an ageability to Sauvignon Blanc in general. that gets often mm -hmm. forgotten about, as Andrew put it, this, and he was kind of bragging that they sell out in six months, so I'm going to let that go. But the, <laughs> the, the truth is, is that- Only to make you mad, Jonah. You, and you did a good job. Uh, but, you know, there's there's those moments when you find uh, a Sauvignon Blanc that's got some age on it that was made in this way. And, and I know that we're leading up to probably as much as, as anyone on this panel when we, when we get to the Lark Mead, that what we've heard so far that's a really great through line is that these are wineries taking Sauvignon Blanc as seriously as they take Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm -hmm. And that is what I think I want. I mean, I look at this, I'm hearing some of these stories, some for the first time. Uh, and I'm, I'm just so impressed with the kind of dedication to that. And that will in turn give us 
the age ability. And it's, it's a misnomer that you have to sacrifice drinkability or deliciousness or fun for age ability. That's not the case. You know, we always say if you're ugly when you're young, you're going to be ugly when you're old. And so the, the truth here is that what we're looking for is, well, it works the other way too, Dan. Sorry, that was negative for you. That, you know, if you, <laughs> if you put all this work and energy that Jenny's talking about, she did into this Sauvignon Blanc, into this care of this wine, that's, a, I think, a brilliant uh, statement for how this wine's going to just continue to grow gracefully for 20 or 30 years. Yeah, it, I mean, it's impressed. really, it's an, it's an impressive wine. I mean, a little, different for sure than just the regular Emelo Sauvignon Blanc. And I do want to point out, this is the Plumeray. This is, this is different. This is a, yes, Jonah. Oh, it's, it's a one liter. Yes, it's a one liter size bottle. So enough, as Jenny points out in, in her tech notes, enough for a family of four to enjoy during dinner. She's just enough thinking of lunch. all, she's thinking <laughs> of you guys. <laughs> well, I'll totally enough for lunch. <laughs> or, a pan, or a panelist at two in the afternoon. Um, Dan, we're gonna we're gonna go to the Lark Me Lily, and I'm again, I'm sorry, I'm swatting at these flies. Um, Lark Me Lily, Dan, uh, take it away. Oh, thank you. Um, I just want to echo what Jonah was saying about the seriousness of what we're all trying to do here. Um, you know, Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc in the in the last twenty years, as we got into the you know the the, the two thousand you know two thousand and, and era and beyond, we saw a lot of people taking trying to take Sauvignon Blanc seriously by throwing a lot of oak on it um and a mm. lot of great there was a lot of great examples i mean whether you're from peter michael or araho now isley or if you were Lale. from vineyard 29 these were wines that said okay we're going to take seven and blanc just throw oak on it and i think that was um a noble effort because i think seven and blanc can hold up to it and it's shown pretty well over the course of the last 20 years but i'm really impressed with the uh with this panel today and the wines that they presented from you know from jenny and her family's approach towards low yields and low yields allowing for she was talking about those gangly clusters allowing the opportunity for the sunshine to fully ripen every berry and to create full kind of phenolic ripeness in that fruit um to andrew and maryvale looking at you know looking at what our true inspiration was wasn't so terms it was you know the white wines of bordeaux and chevrier blanc which is you know some of the great wine white wines in the world and thinking about that kind of skin contact to soften a little bit of that ph and the, and add a little bit of texture um you know and jonah you know working from older vines i mean there's not a lot of older vines you're not talking about 1981 82 plantings you know that's you know peak phylloxera era you know like when people are going to be ripping white wine out of the ground so and older vines are something that are truly spectacular when it comes to Sauvignon Blanc. And then you go to um, Natalie and up on the mountains and you think about what, what was said very early is that you're planting Sauvignon Blanc in great ground for Cabernet. Why would you plant Sauvignon Blanc in Mount Vitor? That just seems insane. Um, but you can see in the bottle why we why they did that, and I think that this panel is very interesting, and you'll and it, it feeds right into the the lurk mead. We don't do much different than everybody else here with regards to how we treat the seriousness of this wine. When we left the Loire Valley in 2009, uh, early 2009, after visiting a number of producers, we we realized very quickly that uh, Sauvignon Blanc in Napa Valley could potentially have a, a different style and different texture and everyone on this panel has uh, been, been uh, approaching that. And um, we looked at it in a way that it also had to be near, more serious to Jonah's point. Um, we had to treat Sauvignon Blanc like Chardonnay, hands down. Like if we were gonna get people, you know, unfortunately Frog's Leap made the decision to outprice all the red wines with the white wine, but <laughs> the majority, 99% of Nap Valley wines can't do that, right? Like 99% of Nap Valley wines are, plant, um, are pricing their Cabernet Sauvignons at, way, you know, at a much higher price point because of their long-term aging. So, but we felt that there was a disconnect. If we were gonna make a wine at Larkmead, which we did from 2005 to 2008, that was fast and racy and, and kind of of the moment with regards to a table fresh white wine, you know, we planted a lot of Sauvignon Blanc that was purchased by Duckhorn over the years. We were inspired by wines like Frog's Leap and Honig and, you know, the kind of the, the $20 price point white, white wine that meant to be on the table. Um, but then we realized our Cabernet prices were coming out of out of proportion to where seven and Blanc prices were. We needed to make a wine that felt like it was, you know, siblings. And part of that reasoning was, you know, we just ha we had to have like this kind of marketing and I hate to talk about that, but I mean, I want to have full transparency. We had to have that marketing sense that these wines were of the family. 
And that's why in 2009, we left the, the Loire Valley and, and started um, thinking about how we can change our Sauvignon Blanc program. We went into that longer lease agent. We went into that, uh, that Chardonnay mentality where, you know, yes, we hold cluster press. Yes, we fermented in barrel, but we also fermented in large upright wood tanks. We kept the lees as part of the interaction with this wine for so much longer. And so the 2018 Lily, you know, I've had, I've had wines in, in the Larkin portfolio of Sauvignon Blanc where I would bottle the previous vintage the day before I would harvest the new vintage. So having that kind of, you know, that, that lees cycle, the lees are the, the, the sediment that falls, um, that, clar that falls out of the wine when the wine's clarifying itself, that, but they're through osmosis or building texture, they're building um, aromas and flavors and secondary and tertiary characters and nuance. And I've kind of waited as long as I possibly could with these wines over time. And then that extra bottle aging, like everyone on the panel is, is doing with their wines, is like putting it in bottles, uh, bottling it, and then releasing it later. So this 2018 is our current release with a very similar cycle to what Natalie's doing, to what Jonah's doing, um, completely different from, from what Jenny's doing. I mean, like, that's just mind-blowing what those guys are doing over there. And, that, that's a, it's, it's, and the wine shows how much dedication and, and care there is to that bottle. But... Um, yeah, lark mead is, uh, this is, as I mentioned earlier, it's an estate fruit from lark mead. It is in the northern part of the Napa Valley, five, you know, 10 minutes north of St. Helena, up down by the river, <laughs> um, as you kind of get into, you know, into our kind of more Pleasanton, heavy clay-based soils. Sauvignon Blanc, like Merlot, is a very short growing season grape variety. You want that to, you know, kind of be on cooler soils like uh, like clay in order for the the, the um, you know, the, the vines to kind of extend their maturation growing season. But yeah, this is, um, this is for me, one of the great expressions that we've made over the 10 years we've been, you know, we've been making this style of lily um, because it has its classic Sauvignon Blanc finish to it, but the up, up front and the, and the aroma profile and the front of the mouth texture is where it kind of, it's like, oh, it's a bit of a shape shifter. And then it finishes with, uh, you know, your classic Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, tones and um, no, it's a, it's it's been a fun project for Larkman. It's only 350 cases. It's only you know almost five percent of what we do um, as part of our portfolio. But we take it as serious or more serious. I mean, to go into this particular bottling, we harvested five different parcels over one and a half acres, and wow. and and separated them and brought them back together to make this final blend. Yeah, I mean, I, we've just tasted five Sauvignon Blancs. None of them are, are the same. I mean, to say that there's a, a classically styled Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc, I think at this point is just ridiculous, um, you know, even though I did say that earlier. Um, but certainly, you know, another sort of outlier, um, aromatically different from all of these, texturally different from all of these. It has weight, but it has brightness and it has a restraint. Um, what do you, Dan, what do you think is the most similar to this lily, if you had to pick one? Um, I really, I mean, I'd have to take characteristics of all the wines. I'd have to take mm -hmm. a little bit of the kind of the reserved nose that uh, you got at the Frog's Leap. I'd have to take a little bit of the kind of Andrew's kind of, you know, kind of brightness that's restrained, like kind of like a, a racehorse in the gates, um, which is just super powerful there. Um, with Natalie's fruit profile from the hillside and the cooler, I, I really love what they're doing texturally with those wines. Um, and I can't, I, I, I mean, it's not even in the same league as the uh, Pumerai. I mean, that wine is just delicious and it has everything you want from a, um, an aged white wine. I'm not a huge believer in, in aging white wine, especially, especially Sauvignon Blanc. I like to drink them, you know, within five years. So this is kind of as long as I'd like to wait with this wine personally. Mm -hmm. um, and I would drink the hell out of this. I, I really appreciate the, the kind of the slaty textures. You were talking about Dagano earlier, those slaty textures you get um, and flavors you get from that kind of wet slate. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, they're all kind of pieces of each other. Again, this is the beauty of what we, what this panel is, is it's not like, okay, let's just throw in a hundred percent new fucking French oak and go. And because I think that was, that's a beautiful representation and delicious representation of Chardonnay, but not Sauvignon Blanc necessarily in Napa Valley. But um, what, what's been done farming and thought in going into these wines is probably kind of, you know, I would drink any of these as often as I can moving forward. Yeah. Yes, Jonah. I think that's really, uh, well, well, first I want to say, Dan, congratulations. This is a delicious wine. I like how you took the best of all of us and made it your own. That's very, <laughs> that's wonderful. 
I uh, appreciate that. But you said something there at the end, which I think I want to come back to, and Jenny mentioned on it earlier, uh, farming as an approach toward un both understanding and appreciating uh, pyrazines and, and the many different types that there are, right? Because in some circles, it's a real negative. At frog's leap, it's not. Like we, you know, look, there's isopropyl methoxypyrazine, there's isobutyl methoxypyrazine, there's things that we kind of all kind of fear, but there's, there's Jonah, a can I time out? Can I time you out just real quick and tell me what yeah. the pyrazines are? Because I'm sure there's a million people out there, like, or a hundred people. Just what are pyrazines real oh, quick? Well, let's, yeah, let's start with it. Like pyrazine, let's think of it like a category that's this big. And it contains a whole lot of aromas and flavors. And it, it can include things like your grassiness, and it can include things like your uh, jalapeno pepper or green bell pepper. But the thing is, is that you, as you narrow that, you come down into a set, you go from pyrazine or pyrazine to methoxypyrazine, and then you're gonna get down into isopropyl or isobutyl methoxypyrazine. And those are the ones that taste like roasted green bell pepper. Those are the things that are part of the capsicum kind of world. And those are what we sometimes, um, have learned to maybe fear, maybe fear too much. That's a panel at another time. But what I think we've seen is, is that growing your grapes in a certain way, Jenny's doing it with this really cool brushing technique, which is awesome and, and costly, you know? And I think then there's, there's putting it up on, oh, what do we got there? Uh, science. Yeah, science, yeah. <laughs> and then there's, and then there's uh, Natalie's thinking, hey, let's just put this up in Mount Veeder where we're gonna, we're gonna find a way for the nature to come out of that quickly. And like what we do at Frog Sleep is we don't irrigate. So we're gonna go dry farm the whole way so that we get the grapevine to come out of a cycle so that it, it lignifies earlier and we can get out of that thing. But if you think about what we're looking at here, we've tasted five Sauvignon Blancs and we're talking about tons of flavors and aromas and no one's saying green bell pepper. Versus 20 years ago, we'd be talking about grades of green bell pepper, <laughs> you know, I mean, and it's farming has come a long way. Our understanding of the importance of sunlight on a cluster or dappled sunlight through, and I know Andrew does this, where you can get canopy to get dappled sunlight in. Like there's, there's so many ways now that we're understanding it, but it takes that commitment to growing this thing, I think properly. And, and a lark mead, I think is a great example of you guys farm for your uh, product. You think about like all these distinctions and I'd hate for us to go through this whole thing and talk about, so, and I love to talk about the winemaking, but not talking about the care that went into farming as well, mm. because that's something that also separates. We're talking about putting a tremendous amount of work into uh, a, a wine that in most cases is going to sell for between 25 to 35 bucks at the end of the day. And, and we're putting, you know, the same farming technique as we do with, uh, and I'm sure Dan does with cab and, Clearly, Jenny even puts maybe even more in. Like that, that, that we grow grapes right next to her vineyards, and uh, it, we we we're we're, the, we're like get them bigger, let's make this thing, let's get more. Because there's also something to be said for carriage of fruit. Like I know we don't like to talk about it; it's a nasty thing sometimes. But sometimes at our Galeron vineyard, Jenny, uh, we're right across the river or right across the dirt lane from you guys, next to the river. If we get six tons per acre five and a half tons per acre, the wines are better than if we got three tons, three and a half, because too much vigor is being jammed into too few grapes, you know? And so it's an, it, Sauvignon Blanc to me more than Cabernet is, is a delicate, it's a balance you've got to walk between. You've got to take it block by block and maybe even vine by vine. In your case, you're taking it cluster by cluster. Uh, but that's a love that comes from that sort of thing. Sorry, Dan, go ahead. No, no, Jonah, you're right. And this goes back to a lot to um, the history when of Sauvignon Blanc in Napa Valley that Amanda was talking about. Larry Hyde got some of his first Sauvignon Blanc as he got his Chardonnay from the Wente vineyards. Mm -hmm. And those, the Sauvignon Blanc that went to Wente was the classic clone one of, uh, of Napa Valley. And that was the classic clone one of Chateau Yakem that came over to Wente and then Wente um, gave pass along Sauvignon Blanc and mostly Chardonnay because it was a different, um, uh, from, obviously not from Bordeaux, but, and Jonah, you're hundred percent accurate. I think this idea of low yields, uh, naturally there's low yields in Juliana Vineyard and, and, and Andrew's experiencing in, in Hope Valley, but this idea that there's this balance between, you know, yield, yield is everyone you know, on this panel knows is the determining factor of cost of goods in these finished bottles of wine. And when you have a low yielding year like 17 or you have a high yielding year like 18, like most of these wines here, 
low yielding in 15, your, your, it's, your impact is not only fiscal, but it's also qualitative. And Sauvignon yeah. Blanc and Chardonnay are two grapes that do really well in that four to six ton an acre range. But we have this mindset that Cabernet needs to be at two to three tons. And then we kind of try to transfer that over to other grape varieties. But in, in this particular instance, I can't imagine any of these vineyards producing more than four to six tons an acre. It's interesting. I, I have the question of, of why Napa Valley for summing up Blanc, what is the reason that it that it works so well and, and we can produce so many different styles? Is it for, is that what you're talking about, Dan? <laughs> so I'm so happy to answer this question. Um, <laughs> I, I'm probably the only person in the world that thinks Napa Valley is a noble grape variety. Um, and the reason I say that is, be, uh, excuse me, Sauvignon Blanc? Sauvignon Blanc is a noble okay. grape variety. <laughs> Um, is because Sauvignon Blanc can travel. It travels everywhere. It does well in the Loire Valley. It does well in Napa Valley. It does well in Northeast Italy. It does well in South Africa. It does well in New Zealand. And it takes on a little bit of that kind of terroir, but it never loses its essence. It never loses its core, its soul. Um, we all know, we know it's Sauvignon Blanc. It just has the, the dress code of whether it's New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc or Napa, Loire, Friuli, et cetera. Um, and that's why I think no matter what, if you think about those regions I just mentioned, you think about the varying temperatures that are in each of those kind of growing degree day seasons. And that's just accumulation of heat. And there's some are cool, some are hot. And there's not a lot of great varieties in the world that can do that. We know Cabernet can do it, Chardonnay can do it. We know Syrah can do it. We know Pinot Noir can do it. We know Merlot can do it. Um, Sauvignon Blanc can do it. But I'm a lover of Italian wine and I, Nebbiolo can't do it. Sangiovese can't do it. You know, like there are grapes that just can't travel well. And, but Sauvignon Blanc travels incredibly well at high quality in many locations throughout the planet. And uh, that for that reason, it's noble and it should, it deserves its place at the table al alongside, you know, except for, yeah, alongside so many other ones. But, yeah, and uh, to, but yeah, to, to jump on, <laughs> to, to tack onto that though, then the Napa Valley offers a great opportunity because it is the patchwork quilt opportunity right you know with varying different soil types that are sometimes delimited by only feet not yards not meters but feet and and then temperature changes and an opportunity to stay uh, like jenny and me down next to the river at some point you know on on sometimes of soils sort of, of high fertility or up on mount feeder uh where things change or up in calistoga or over in pope valley so we also have, we have a clearly noble variety. It's parentage and lineage of Cabernet Sauvignon notwithstanding. But like, you know, we have this opportunity to say, hey, we've got this extraordinary grape with this great history that can uh, flourish in many places, but can also be uh, something that you can put around the Napa Valley and maybe even more so than Chardonnay. Uh, it, can, it, can, it can take on its uh, AVA uh, more than anything else. I want to talk about, um, it, it's, an, it's an important point, Jonah and Dan and, and Natalie, should, certainly if you have uh, thoughts on Sauvignon Blanc being a noble variety. I saw you partying over there when, when Dan said that. <laughs> Please chime in. But I want to talk a little bit about serving this wine because I, I know there's a lot of um, a lot of industry people out here, a lot of people that are working with this from a, a hospitality standpoint. Um, and maybe Jenny, as, as the elder Sauvignon Blanc producer, um, Yeah. Sorry, Amanda. Are you there? Hey, Sorry. Jenny, we can hear you. I'm Go back. ahead. Back. I missed everything Amanda said. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you, I can't hear Amanda again. Okay, Sorry, Jenny, we're just going to go with you. There you go. I'm sorry. I. I, I hit do not disturb on my uh, on my computer, but my phone didn't get the memo. Okay, um, you're back. Uh, Jenny, with the oldest Sauvignon Blanc, not that you were the elder of the group, uh, but the elder Sauvignon Blanc, uh, can you talk about what, what temperature you would prefer to serve uh, an, an older Sauvignon Blanc? And then maybe we'll dive into uh, to Natalie after that to see if there's any contrast. Yeah, I uh, personally, I pull it out of the fridge and open it, but I, I produced another Sauvignon Blanc that's just called MLO Sauvignon Blanc. And that I think pulled out, pulled out of the refrigerator, just very cold off ice is perfect. Um, and I think the plumeray tastes great as well, but I've noticed if it sits in the glass, even just 
I'm outside here and it's warmed up and I, I, I don't have an exact temperature, you know, number for you, but I think this wine does show well as it warms a little bit more that kind of, uh, kind of biscuit character comes through kind of like a baked sourdough, um, a mm -hmm. little sweet petrol. I think it kind of gets a little showier in that regard when it is a few degrees warmer than than right out of the right out of the refrigerator. So, um, but you know, again, I love I love a fresh, lighter, leaner, cold Sauvignon Blanc as well. But for this, uh, Jenny, just, uh, I just want to go back real quick because I yeah. Uh, it, uh, what is uh, why is the Plumeri coming in a one liter bottle? Um, there's a few reasons. Like ultimately, it just felt unique and special and different. Um, but you know, I I often will share it with a you know four people, six people at a restaurant in particular, and you know a 750 doesn't it goes around pretty quickly. Um, and this is low alcohol. I think it it's kind of easy to drink with food, um, and this allows for for a little bit more. Um, I would I would more like is to more. I would say I'm gonna say I love your restraint. If you if you think you can spread a liter around four people, like this is just for me and my wife. Like I am really like I uh, doesn't go that far, Jonah. But you know, I think you need to make three liters of it. Is what we need to be doing. Yeah, uh, Natalie, um, with the the leanest and lightest of the of the Sauvignon Blancs, do you have a preference of temperature for this? I mean, I think the reality is a lot of Sauvignon Blancs get pulled straight out of the fridge or the ice bucket, and that's how they're enjoyed. But to Jenny's point, I think we have a tendency to serve our whites too cold. And sometimes I think that can mask a lot of the intentional or not on unintentional uh, flavor profiles in the wine. And I think a trait of a good Sauvignon Blanc is that it can warm up in a glass and continue to evolve and continue to show different sides of itself. And I think what we are going, you know, so for me, you know, maybe I do like my whites maybe a little warmer and even my reds, I always say maybe a little on the colder side, I can be the opposite. So I think for me, it, to have a white wine where you're not afraid of it sitting out is really the key. And then kind of back to Dan and the Noble Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, the, tasting through these, all I can think about is like how great these would be with a meal. And I think that's also a good thing for people to really focus on, especially with a Sauvignon Blanc, which people think of it as an aperitif or just as, you know, a lack of a lack of a better word, a patio pounder, you know, type of wine. I think, you know, these are just really beautiful examples that can hold up to heartier meats, even be it a lean pork or a grilled chicken or spicy. I just think the versatility of Sauvignon Blanc should really be pushed a little bit more, be it BTB or BTG, you know, kind of profile as well. Um, Jonah, uh, thoughts on uh, food and wine pairings? It's diverse. It's much more diverse than we give it credit for. Um, and I think the obvious ones that jump to mind are you think about your lighter sea, uh, shellfish and seafood sort of ideas, right? But for me, I, I love something blanc at 55 degrees, like straight out of the cellar with something like a roast chicken. I, I mean, show of hands of panelists, who's all spent, you know, a few nights in Sancerre or in, uh, in Puy? Like it's, the, the cuisine is so adapted to it that like I went into a steakhouse and I was like, hey, I'm going to have a steak. What should I have? And they were like, Sancerre. And you're like, oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to have uh, fish. What should I have? Sancerre. Like there's no, there's just no getting around it. And I think that there's something to be said for that, right? And look, you know, goat cheese and chef and all, you just kind of feel the vibe of what happens in that region. And and I want to do a quick shout out to La Set, which I think doesn't get quite, I mean, Dagonel is great and we all, you know, it's certainly Miss Didier. But I think if you look at what has happened with like what La Set did for the region and the Baron de El Cuvée especially, it's been with the uh, winemaker there who I've spent a number of years with every year. She has taught me more about understanding the cuisine arc of a great Sauvignon Blanc more than almost anyone. And she uses age as a way to kind of oscillate between cuisine. So straight out of the bottling line for your oysters and your, uh, you know, mussels, your moule frites, but then aging it a little more if you're gonna get into chicken or pork or those sorts of things. So we can think about the age as a way of also understanding uh, pairability. And, and I think that that gives it in this, this lineup 
kind of demonstrates it. It gives us this kind of wider breadth than we would have expected. I know I came into this, you know, 20 years ago thinking Sauvignon Blanc was a, a one trick pony with a very uh, narrow uh, pairing window. And I've thrown that out completely. Do you think, I mean, Jonah, do you think when 20 years ago, so, and sorry, Dan, I'll, I'll get to that, but do you think 20 years ago uh, that was sort of the case? I mean, do, do you think there was as wide an array of styles as there is now? I mean, we're sitting here with five different wines that couldn't be more different. And the only thing they really have in common is uh, for a few of them, they're from Rutherford and, you know, they're Sauvignon Blanc. We are in the golden age of Sauvignon Blanc. There's no doubt about it. Um, and in the last five years alone have been a massive uh, shift. And so, no, you're right. But 20 years ago that they were available, but you had to go to Northern Italy like Dan mm. does, or you had to go to uh, a small producer or even right. a big producer in Sancerre. So like you had to go diverse. Now I, it's I Napa. Was, I'm talking about Napa Valley, like oh, having yeah, no. this much. Yeah. It, and it damn, wasn't sorry. even close. It wasn't even close. And we all, like my wife was vice president at Duckhorn for 14 years. We all know about like the power of the duck. Right, they were the powerhouse Sauvignon Blanc, and love and respect to Alex and Pete. Peace, no, no harm, no foul. But like you know, there is something to be said for they developed a style that was a Duckhorn House style with twenty four percent Semillon and like a really uh, specific approach. And what we've seen now is we've all broken away. From, uh, a lot of us have broken away from that and are experimenting. And I think that's amazing. And that's probably yeah. five to seven years. Yeah, Dan. I agree, I agree with Jonah. It's, I, I would say a little farther back than five to seven, because I, I did mention earlier, I do feel that the whole Sauvignon Blanc movement in Napa Valley, you know, came out of the fact that guys like Duckhorn and, and, and Honig and Frog's Leap were making very table fresh, friendly wine, stainless steel derived, they didn't have the money for oak. And then when um, fancy brands got on board and said, well, we can't really grow Chardonnay in Napa Valley in the 2000 era, uh, we and Sauvignon Blanc is here. We have to throw oak on it, and I think the last ten years or more, uh, ten to fifteen years, is when we started seeing that experimentation. I think it's 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 been wonderful and wild to see it. And there's been never been more demand for Sauvignon Blanc grapes in Napa Valley. The price has gone up for grapes. Um, it's it's just been wild. You can't find great Sauvignon Blanc planted in Napa Valley anymore uh, because it's just everyone wants it. And there's so much great versatility and nobility to it. But I will say this, and I don't know, uh, um, I, I, don't, I don't spend a lot of times in uh, eating in, in Brasserie and Bistro in France like Jonah does. But um, I, I will say that um, if you take any one of these wines, all five of these wines down to Bouchon in Yonville, uh at that Brasserie level, these are the wines you want to drink. No matter what you eat, whether it's boudin blanc or oysters or pâtés or 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 terrines, these are the wines, hands down. Um, and you can take them over to Angel, you can take them over to Gentil. This is classic French bistro wines taken to another level. Um, and I think that these are this is from food pairing perspective. You can put a French bistro in your head. You can put Sauvignon Blanc on your menu. And I think that's the easiest way to think about food pairing. <laughs> um, I just want to draw attention. We are uh, officially at our time limit that uh, the Napa Valley, oh my Lord, look at down to go. Um, that said, I, you know, I think this is an incredible discussion that I would love to continue. And, and we've got a few more questions uh, in the way of clones and barrels and a few other things. So we're going to continue this for a few more minutes um, as long as everyone can. Uh, but I, I do want to thank everyone who has joined in thus far. Uh, we still have 93 attendees, uh, which is amazing, that have sat and listened to all of us talk about Sauvignon Blanc. So, um, so thank you. I know it's amazing. Um, but I want to continue the conversation. So if you guys can stay with us and uh, continue, continue to geek out a little bit. Um, the Sauvignon Musquet uh, situation. I don't know who wants to take it, but Sauvignon Musquet, you know, you go to a winery, um, you talk to a, a winemaker and they're like, it's 93% Sauvignon Blanc and 7% Musquet. And you kind of like look at him, you're like, what does that mean? Um, so who, who wants to take the Musquet question? What does it mean? Daniel. Um, yeah, I've worked with Seven of Musquet. I've worked with Chardonnay Musquet. It's just, it's just, it's a variant. Um, the muscatty character that you get, that floral character, it's usually high acid in, in its representation uh, here in California and Napa Valley. Um, it really just adds, you know, 
a level of florality and a level of acidity um, that uh, that is not present in like the most omnipresent clone in Napa, which is clone one. Okay. It's very small. Uh, Jenny. I mean, very small production. Yeah, Jenny. Yeah, question for Dan. Like to, to Amanda's point, would you? We uh, the, the Sauvignon Blanc de Plumeray is clone one, but I, we've got a neighboring vineyard that we farm that goes into my other Sauvignon Blanc that is Muscane, and I love them both. But I would I'm curious to know if, as winemakers whether you guys would consider that. You know, would you are you apt to tell people this is like Amanda was saying? You know, sixty percent Muscat, forty percent, or do you just consider it all Sauvignon Blanc? Question. Personally, I just want to consider it all Sauvignon Blanc. Just, I think we get into this deeper conversation to the one or two or three percent of people who give a shit um, whether or not it's a clone <laughs> Musquet, especially when it comes to Chardonnay. I think people, you know, people are like, "What? I don't understand what that clone is. It's not Dijon. Yeah. Like that's the only word they know. It relates to a mustard." But, um, but re the reality is that it's like there's the cl there's only 29 clones of Sauvignon Blanc in the world. Like there's a very small amount of them. Right, and the majority of them are like been manufactured in Northeast Italy and Ruscedo and in, in the you know, kind of clonal home to the world. Um, but the ones that we kind of play homage to and we kind of love and are, are the ones that we get from Bordeaux um, because Bordeaux was there before everyone else. No matter every, everyone else was making grapes and making wine before everyone else, but Bordeaux was there before everyone else, um, just mentally. So, um, but we get and that's clone one. You know, it's like the same reason why three three seven is the most widely planted Cabernet clone in Cab in Napa Valley because that's the was the most widely planted Cabernet clone in Bordeaux. We've just done everything the Bordelais have done 150 years before us. I think, and you know, Jenny, to that point, like I think it's interesting to think about, like, is is Musquet in and of itself good or bad? No, but to me, it's how is it used? What does it do? How does it change things? And I think that's what. And then you four are much more of this than I am. You guys are both architect and engineer, whereas I, whatever role I play, it's more architect. I don't get into the engineering. And I think about Sauvignon Musquet, it's like, well, what does it do? Is it, is, it, is it elevating terroir and variety or is it overshadowing? And I think that's what's really fascinating about Musquet can be a bit, you, we all remember the old cane Musquet, right? Like, I used to pull that wine out all the time to just show people what does it taste like, what does it taste like. But there was things that Chris admitted, you know, uh, exaltingly was doing to kind of help uh, highlight those. I, I think it's really a fascinating question. From like, I guess it's really comes down to what are you what are you trying to get out of it? And you farm a lot of it. What is it? What is the point of Musquet? Natalie. Um. I'm curious because we do have a little Musquet, but it typically all falls into the red Sauvignon Blanc, which Dan, you have. So I mean, in terms of picking it out, I think Sauvignon Blanc already is a very, very highly aromatic variety as a whole. And so I think sometimes that can be a detriment to it if you're only working with the Musquet clone, because it seems very one note actually to me. And with working with the clone one, um, it actually balances it to me a little bit more, makes it a little bit more, uh, doesn't just allow you to focus on aromatics, but a little bit more on everything else going on. And we rarely have people that, you know, go through it and go, oh, this is definitely loose game. We, we only talk about it if people really want to, but I mean, it's definitely, as Dan said, kind of just like a word people like to throw out there and just see how people react a little bit, I think, for sure. Um, we have a question from our friend John Scupney. Uh, I'm sure some of you know from Ling and Reed. Uh, yes, everyone, <laughs> everyone's ready. They're like bracing themselves. What does John have to say? Um, any thoughts or any thoughts or your discoveries on the genetics of Sauvignon Blanc and or its parental impact on Cabernet Sauvignon? I don't think about it at all. <laughs> Great, excellent <laughs> answer, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think yeah. we'll see a lot more of its parental impact on Cabernet Sauvignon as climate changes. Okay. Um, speaking of which, there is a question about rising ABV. Is it an issue for any of the winemakers? And is there any point uh, where winemakers would consider steps to keep alcohol at a certain level? Oh, Jonah, there it is. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I don't know if we Look, have enough time. You, you, no, you don't. We don't have <laughs> enough time. And I'm sure my battery is going to run out before this is over. The, the truth is, is that, I mean, obviously climate change is, and, and Dan, uh, I want to take a quick moment to applaud and congratulate you for taking such a, uh, an amazing lead in our industry on this topic. It's not comfortable. 
no one likes it. There's no way to come out on the positive side, but you've done something that I think is really important. You've brought us all back to the table to discuss it. Um, it for Frog Sleep, it goes back uh, 32 years. We've been organically grown. We use solar power. We use you know French fry oil in the tractors, but that's all just a pittance in compared to like what's really happening. The to me, Amanda, if we're talking about uh, climate and those things, we we really should be tying this somewhat directly, not totally, but somewhat directly to to amount of water we're putting on a plant. And I think grape vines in this valley have a long history of no irrigation. You know, from uh, the 1840s and 50s up to uh, Andy Bextoffer claims 1971 when he added drip. You know, and so we have a big uh, arc. And we've seen, personally speaking, the impact of non-irrigation on the ability for a grapevine to move its lignification cycle, its ripening cycle, up on the calendar. So it's not uncommon for us to be picking Sauvignon Blanc on uh, August 7, August 8. Uh, our, my earliest in 17 years was we did one day on July 31. There's nothing quite like preparing to pick grapes on July 31. Like there's, there's a moment when even I go, that's insane. Like that's insane. But the truth is, is that is that we can we can use the natural instinct of the grapevine, its abscisic acid cycle, the, the, the hormones stored in the roots of the plant to push it into lignification and respire my uh, I, IBMPs and things that can be used as like a, the ability to to keep aphids off of the growing stems. Those can be used in conjunction. Um, I don't think this is a way to stop or combat climate change. I think we need to be looking at a billion other things then, but this is a way for us to kind of start leaning into. And um, I like Dan's approach and others on the panel approach of saying, hey, we need to plant, we need to be planting other varieties, experimental varieties. You can look at what Aaron Weinkoff is doing. And I think that's really uh, both fascinating and instructive and what Rory is doing, going back to things like Charbonneau uh, and Carignan. But, the truth is, is that that's just us adapting to the larger thing. I think we can lean into the parentage of Sauvignon Blanc on Cabernet Sauvignon and say, hey, this is a thing that if we can uh, use access to water as a way to shorten or bring forward into the calendar year some of the uh, uh, lignification and respiration of IBMP, we might, be, we might find ourselves in a better opportunity to, to make the kind of wines that we uh, uh, can hold on to for another 20, 50, 60, 70 years. Yeah. I want to um, wrap this up with one final question. I'll give each of you 30 seconds to answer. Uh, the future of Sauvignon Blanc in Napa Valley, does it overtake Chardonnay? How does it compare to Chardonnay? Do we need to compare it to Chardonnay? Natalie. I think it's a worthy adversary to Chardonnay. Instead of it being kind of the stepchild in the corner, it's definitely going to be considered a little more serious moving forward. Jenny? Uh, I, I would agree. I, I honestly don't don't compare it much to Chardonnay. It's just its own animal. Um, I love Sauvignon Blanc from Napa Valley. Uh, of course, I love some Chardonnays too, but I'm I'm Napa Sauvignon Blanc girl. So I, I do think all here on this panel, you know, are taking Sauvignon Blanc in Napa to the next level. And I think that's going to go a long ways. Does it overtake Chardonnay as a, as the leading variety in Napa Valley? I don't know about in my lifetime. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, and, all right, Andrew. Not, not, it doesn't overtake it for me. I, I love Sauvignon Blanc in Napa. I think Jenny put it very well. Um, and I think there's a lot of different expressions as indicated by the tasting today. Um, I think my heart personally is still with Chardonnay. I don't see it overtaking that for me. Um, but to Jonah's point about being a golden age of Sauvignon Blanc, I, I do believe that that's true. And it's interesting how my idea of Sauvignon Blanc changes when I taste these wines and how I feel like I still have a lot of room to grow in my appreciation for the varietal and the styles it's made in. Um, so I don't know, I feel like I learned a lot today too and about, about the future of Sauvignon Blanc. So maybe I'm a little more open-minded than I was when we started this, which I think is great. I'm genuinely not sure if Jonah or Dan goes next, but since Dan is next to Andrew, going Dan first. 
Um, it will never take over at Chardonnay, unfortunately, and because there's one reason is that the majority of Chardonnay in Napa Valley is put into our sparkling wine houses, Schramsberg, Chandon, Mom, Domaine Carneros. A lot of that Chardonnay is grown in bulk in Carneros and in the cooler climates of Oak Knoll. So it won't take over on a physical basis until the sparkling wine houses change their base wine out of Chardonnay into something different. Um, but if you look at the actual bottled wine, of Chardonnay versus Sauvignon Blanc in the Napa Valley in the next 10 years, 100% sure, uh, Sauvignon Blanc will be a greater production of bottled uh, wines in, uh, in Napa Valley. All right, Jonah. Well, I love how everyone took a different kind of approach around yeah. the ring, and including Dan, who just quickly got down to like the Nielsen numbers of how things are going to shake out. As he does. <laughs> But I want to point out this guy, Rob McCormish, who just said uh, he's, he stopped buying Chardonnay, he switched to SB because of style. Now, here's what I want to say. I think it comes down to that. The customers will tell us what's going to grow and what's going to do well. And if we can produce more varying uh, styles of Sauvignon Blanc that are interesting, smart, and deserve a place on your table, it'll flourish. I've found that in my 22 years, I'm a terrible predictor of what the customer's going to do, so I'm going <laughs> to leave that alone. But what I will say is I love the fact that we're also finding more people passionate and obsessed with these specific spots, right? And, and, and there's great reason to be obsessed with Chardonnay. There's a great reason to be obsessed with something Blanc. Find your thing, both as an architect, an engineer, a winemaker, a president, a vintner, or whatever, and push into it. Lean into it and put your heart and soul into it. And I commend, and I, I'll wrap this up, and I think I speak for all of us, I commend all of you and Amanda and the vintners for putting this on, but also for leaning in so hard into this idea. I've, I'm not only inspired by everything I've heard from Natalie and Jenny and Andrew and Dan, but like I want to go back and steal some of your ideas. So uh, <laughs> congratulations on helping me to make Frog Sleep better. But I just, it's, it's heartwarming and, and it's really lovely to see um, this once kind of outcast variety of uh, finding its foothold in the, in the illiterati of the Napa Valley. And, and uh, for, I, I'm just so proud to be a part of it. And I thank you all for all you've done and for coming on today and speaking about it. I think it's really lovely. And Amanda, thank you for being the best moderator in the business. Oh man, thank you guys. That was way more than 30 seconds, Jonah, but I'll, I'll let it slide with that last You know the difference between me. I don't know how to <laughs> time myself. Um, well, you know, I, I, I'm going to wrap it up. I really appreciate all of you guys. I think, you know, we, we certainly set out to prove that there is a wide, a wide array of styles within this uh, relatively small Appalachian. Napa Valley is an incredible place. It's a diverse place. It's a place that allows for experimentation, allows for many different varieties uh, and various styles within single varieties itself. So I think we've definitely proven that point today. Um, I think if, you know, somebody had asked what the classic Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc style is, I think, you know, right now in this moment, the classic style is diversity. It's anything goes, it's, um, it's push the boundaries, see what works, see what sticks. Um, and whatever the future holds, I don't know. And, and I'm not going to uh, predict uh, as Jonah has said. So um, all I can say is hopefully we can continue these conversations, learn from each other and continue doing the best we can to make Napa Valley the absolute best region for producing wine in the world. So thank you all so much for being here today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you to, uh, wow, 70, 74 people have stayed on all through this thing. Guys, thank you. Really amazing. It's been an hour and a half that you guys have taken out of your day to learn about Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc. Thank you to the Vintners for allowing us this forum. Uh, and again, um, all of this information will be available uh, via the email they're going to send after this. This this webinar will be available um, to watch, uh, I think, via, via YouTube and, and via the website. Um, and then, of course, be, do pay attention to more seminars and webinars to come. Uh, the Vintners put this out for free, so we really appreciate them doing that and uh, making this available to all of you guys, both consumers and trade alike. Thank you all. Enjoy the five bottles of Sauvignon Blanc you have this afternoon. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>